And the Buddha teaches the practice of universal goodwill, or the Brahma Viharas as a whole. He does it in two main contexts. One, context in which you've been wronged by other people. And two, context in which you have wronged other people. It's necessary in both. In the first context, it's basically for your protection. Not against their wrong, but protection against your own possible unskillful actions you might do in response. There's that image where he says, you know, even if bandits pinned you down and started sawing off your limbs with a two-handled saw, you should still have goodwill for them. That's a pretty extreme example, and he men means it to be extreme, because most of us don't get hurt in those ways, but we get hurt in other ways, and we think that we're justified in snapping back, mistreating the other person. But the Buddha wants you to keep that extreme example in mind, so that when people are, say things to you or do things to you that are not nice, remember, okay, at least they're not sawing off my, my limbs with a two-handled saw. And then you ask yourself, what would be the skillful way to act around them? You may think they don't deserve your goodwill, but what's goodwill for, unless it's for everybody? I mean, the type of goodwill where you treat people nicely only because they treat you nicely, that's pretty common. You want something special, you have to be able to have goodwill. In other words, wish for people's happiness. It doesn't mean, may you be happy sawing off my limbs. It's more. May you realize the causes are to happiness and act on them. That way that person's happiness would be for the good of not only that person, but also everybody else around. And that's a wish you can have without being hypocritical. It may take some training, because part of the mind may say, well, let's see this person suffer a little bit first, and then we can wish for their happiness. But you have to think of the Buddha. He taught everybody, as we said that in the chant just now. The Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha are refuges for all beings. And there are questions asked. What is your past? What have you done to the Buddha in the past, maybe? The Buddha had to treat people who had mistreated him, perhaps, in the past, but he didn't hold it against them. He taught them how to put an end to suffering. This tradition, even in the commentaries, that the Buddha actually taught Mara, finally converted Mara after all those many attempts to get in the Buddha's way. So basically, the Buddha is saying, have the kind of compassion he did. He taught an end to suffering, not only for people who deserve not to suffer, but for everybody, whether you quote unquote deserve your suffering or not. It wasn't a matter of deserving or not deserving, it was simply a matter of discernment. Realizing that if you could find true happiness within, it would actually be for everybody's good. So that was the kind of goodwill the Buddha had. Goodwill for everybody, no matter who had wronged him in the past. He would still teach them. The other time that he recommended, of course, is when you've done harm to other people. And the Buddha says you should resolve not to repeat that harm and then spread goodwill to everybody. Spread goodwill to others to remind yourself, if you ever think of doing harm again, well, wait a minute, I'm supposed to have goodwill for this person. Is this action actually going to be leading to their welfare? And if it's not, why do it? You want to have some consistency, you want to have some loyalty to your original intention. And then goodwill for yourself. If you get down on yourself for things you've done in the past that are not honorable, you can think about that only for so long, and then you start lashing back, saying, well, maybe it wasn't so bad. You 
or else you start thinking of yourself as being a miserable person. And again, you can think of that thought only for so long, and then you start lashing back. So have goodwill for yourself. Just as you spread goodwill to all beings, whether they deserve it or not, you should have goodwill for yourself whether you think you deserve it or not. In other words, may I find, understand the causes for true happiness and be able to act on them. This thought, too. Some people have the feeling they don't deserve to have goodwill for themselves. It's like when we're sitting here meditating, sometimes you come across this feeling of well-being. And part of the mind may say, I don't deserve this. You've got to argue with that. Again, the question of deserving or not deserving doesn't enter into this. It's the same sort of problem with survivors of mass suffering. The ones who come out sometimes feel that they owe it to the others who didn't survive to be miserable for the rest of their lives. They don't feel right about finding happiness. But the Buddha's teaching happiness here as a wise thing to do. And it's not a question of justice as to who deserves and doesn't deserve it. In fact, as many people have noted, the concept of justice doesn't exist in Buddhism as a goal. Some people find that a severe lack. But then if everybody were treated to their just desserts, as the Buddha said, no one would be able to find enlightenment, find awakening. If you had to meet up with the consequences of all your actions in the past before you can gain awakening, it would never happen. So instead of imposing ideas of justice on us, or imposing ideas of justice on one another, the Buddha has us think thoughts of goodwill for ourselves, and think of finding true happiness as a gift not only to ourselves but also to others. A wise thing to do. By lessening the suffering you cause for yourself, you'd be less likely, likely to cause suffering for others. And also, in, in terms of that, having done wrong to other people, the Buddha also has you spread thoughts of goodwill as a way of lightening the karmic backlash. He says, if you have an unlimited mind, train yourself in virtue, train yourself in discernment, train yourself not to be overcome by pleasure or pain which are issues of concentration and discernment. Then any past karma that comes back, when the results come from past bad karma, they're going to be a lot less. It gives the example of the, the lump of salt. If you put the lump of salt in a small glass of water, you can't drink the water because there's so little water there. But if you put it into a large, clean river, you can drink the water from the river, but no problem, it's not too salty. There's another image that kind of rubs the wrong way. He says it's the difference between a poor person stealing a goat and a rich person stealing a goat. When a rich person steals a goat, he usually gets away with it. Very little punishment. A poor person steals a goat and gets thrown into prison. Here the wealth stands for the expanse of mind. You can develop an expansive mind, and you don't have to suffer the results of your past actions nearly as much as you would have without that expansive mind. Of course, need, together with expansive mind, there's the training in virtue and discernment, learning how not to be overcome by pleasure, not overcome by pain, which is a matter both, as I said, both of concentration and discernment. When you're sitting here, you learn how to deal with pains in the body as you get the mind to settle down, working with the breath, working with your attitude, working with the places you focus, so you can live with pain and not suffer from it. The same with pleasure. You can live with pain, excuse me, live with pleasure and not suffer from it, i.e. you don't get distracted by it. That's one of the skills you have to develop as you concentrate the mind. Feeling of ease comes up, and it's all too easy to leave the breath and wall around in the pleasure for a while, and the pleasure will stay for a bit, and then it'll turn into something else. Because the cause of the pleasure was the fact that you had constant, excuse me, constant alertness to the breath. So you keep the cause going, and the pleasure 
the result will stay. When you learn to make that distinction, that's how you be avoid getting waylaid by pleasure. As for pleasures and pains outside, they're going to be the pains of people's words. As the Buddha said, you have to realize that human speech has good and bad speech, well-meaning, ill-meaning, true, false. This is a normal way of human speech. And so when there's unpleasant speech out there, you don't take it into your heart. Just leave it there at the Leave it there at your ear, as the Buddha says. Tell yourself, and those unple unpleasant sound has made contact at the ear. And leave it there. Don't drag it in and create lots of narratives around it. This doesn't mean that we ignore people who teach us valuable things or who criticize us. But we learn to take the criticism to see, okay, what in there is a good lesson, and the rest you can just leave. It's, this is another way in which you teach yourself that you don't have to suffer from things outside, and you don't even have to suffer from a lot of your own past karma. You can train the mind. Think of the case of Angulimala. He killed all those people. The Buddha taught him to gain awakening, and he didn't have to suffer 999 deaths. And we like that story because we think, well, there's hope for everybody. You can imagine that the people whose relatives have been killed. They were not happy. In fact, they actually threw things at Angulimala when he went over his arms around. But as the Buddha told Angulimala, it would have been a lot worse if he hadn't gained awakening. So even the teachings on karma are not there for total justice in a kind of tit-for-tat way. The Buddha's teaching us there's a way out. From all our sufferings, whether we deserve them or not, we can find our way out. And he's happy to teach us to teach it to us, regardless of what our past is. But he wants us to have the same attitude toward people who have wronged us. It's only fair. If you don't want people to impose their ideas of justice on you, you don't impose yours on them. You wish them goodwill. You try to treat them with generosity. You treat them in a virtuous way. In other words, you abstain from harming them. And you have goodwill. Expressing that thought, may this person understand the causes for true happiness and act on them, because it's through that person's actions that that person is going to be happy or not. Just as the same case with you. It's through your actions that you're going to find happiness, through your skill in dealing with things that come up. Past karma comes, you, all kinds of things in our past will, will sprout at some point. And if you learn how to deal with them skillfully, you don't have to suffer. That's what we're learning as we meditate, the skills where we can deal with painful sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations, and ideas, but we don't have to suffer from them. That's a skill that the Buddha wanted to make available to all, and he's willing to be refuge for all who decide that they want to take on his training. He himself never imposed it on anyone. Even the duties of the Four Noble Truths are not duties that he imposes. He simply says, if you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you've got to do. The same with generosity. King once asked him, where should a gift be given? And the Buddha said, where you feel inspired. After all, the Buddha was not our creator. He's not in a position where he can tell us what we have to do, aside from the monks who, once we become ordained, we're committed to following, following his teachings, following the Vinaya. But otherwise, there's no imposition. But he's speaking as an expert. Saying, this is, if you want true happiness, this is what you've got to do. We follow the path voluntarily. This is why the 
time the Buddha was asked, you know, will the whole world gain awakening, or a half, or a third? There was not a question he would answer, because he knew that everybody has the right to make a choice as to whether to follow the path or not. As Ananda explained to the man later, as if there, there's a fortress with the one gate and a wise gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper goes around the fortress. He sees there's not even a hole big enough for a cat to slip through. So he returns to the gate, and he doesn't know how many people are going to enter it through the gate, but he does know if anybody's going to enter the fortress, they have to come by the gate. It's the same with the Buddha. He doesn't know whether the whole world, or half the world, or a third will reach awakening. But he does know whoever's going to do it is going to have to follow this path. And so he makes it available for everybody. And count yourself among one of those. It's your choice. But the opportunity is there, always there. <laughs>